Okay, so um, astronomy in South Africa has a, has a long history. Uh, it, it doesn't, of course, begin with um, you know, the start of colonial times. There were the pre-colonial people in South Africa knew about the stars, they looked up, they had names for the constellations, names for the stars, they had mythologies associated with those. Um, and in the, in the early days of um, uh, the colonial times, um, there were visitors to the Cape who, who occasionally set up temporary observatories and, and made measurements of the stars. Um, but the, the formal history of, of astronomy, or the, 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 the permanent um, astronomy in South Africa, started with <coughs> the British Admiralty who had this problem with ships getting wrecked on the Cape Coast. And one of the problems, uh, one of the causes of that was inaccurate knowledge of, or inadequate knowledge of the Southern Stars and um, inadequate timekeeping. So in 1820, they established a permanent observatory just outside Cape Town in what is now the suburb of Observatory. And the purpose of that was to, to uh, accurately locate stars in the Southern Hemisphere for the purpose of navigation. So an observatory was built. This is a picture, um, it's in fact one of the first photographs ever taken in South Africa. I think this is in 1843. This is what the, the main building of the observatory looked like then. And this is a picture of it as it is today. You can see um, the little domes on the roof have changed, but other one, the building's pretty much the same. The major change I think is in lawnmower technology, which has come on somewhat. <laughs> um, and then as the cities, um, as the city grew, it, it became more and more infeasible to, to do scientific work from, from the cities. There was a lot of light pollution. And in 1972, the Royal Observatory in the Cape and um, the Republic Observatory in Johannesburg merged, forming um, the South African Astronomical Observatory. Um, the headquarters stayed in Cape Town, but the, the um, observing field station was, was um, moved to Sutherland. And the big telescopes from Joburg and Cape Town were moved to Sutherland. This is uh, a picture as it was in in 1974, um, when there were just four telescopes up on the hill. And this is a picture as it looks now. So there are now 21 telescopes up on the plateau uh, and various other scientific instruments, and there are more to come. If you look in the middle of this picture, right at the back, um, it's kind of looking small because it's, it's, uh, it's a long way away. It's right on the far side of the plateau. This is another picture of it. This is the Southern African Large Telescope, which kind of dominates the scene, it's, it's, the scene. It's, it's very much the, the flagship um, telescope of the, of the SAO. And it's uh, a little over 10 meters across, um, the mirror is a little over 10 meters across, which makes it one of the world's largest optical telescopes. And it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful machine, it really is, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. It's also, um, it's a very complex machine. And as such, um, it needs a large team of astronomers and operators and electrical and mechanical technicians and of course software engineers to keep it running. I'm not here to talk about SALT though. I'm going to talk about the so-called small telescopes. Now they're, they're, they're small in comparisons to SALT but they are still very good scientific instruments. Um, they may be old but the optics are still good optics and Sutherland is still a very good site so we shouldn't be neglecting these telescopes. <clears throat> this is a picture of the 1.9 meter telescope at Sutherland. Um, 1.9 meter refers to the, the diameter of the primary mirror, which is um, uh, at the bottom, that, that round thing there, that's about 1.9 meters across. And I, I don't know if um, people may not be aware that you don't look through modern scientific um, telescopes, you, you have an instrument attached to them which collects the light and sends it to a computer which you then analyze. On the left, I don't know if you can really see the, the nameplate um, of this telescope, but there it is in, in more detail. That date, 1938, is the date the mirror was, was cast for this telescope. So it really is, you know, 76 years, it's, it's an old telescope. Um, and so um, we need to find ways to bring these telescopes into the, into the modern age. So what do we do to keep them, to keep them useful? The first thing, of course, mechanical things break down. The, the dome drive, the, the right ascension and declination drive to point the telescope, these kinds of things fail and need to be replaced or at least repaired. And then the other thing we need to do is we need to build instruments which are up-to-date and suitable for modern astronomy. And then that means we need to write software for these two. 
And once we've collected the data, we also need to uh, streamline the data analysis and the data reduction pipelines. So what do we need uh, our instruments to be able to do? What should they be? First thing, of course, they need to work correctly, and we need to be able to verify that they're working correctly. Um, they shouldn't break down at the drop of a hat. They should keep on working. And they should be easy to use, easy for astronomers to, to operate, and they should support multiple modes of access. I'll talk a little bit about that in a while. Um, they should be easy to develop software for, and they should be easy to maintain. And they should not be something which are out of date in five years' time. They should keep on going for, we hope, 20, 25 years still. The other thing is, um, Sutherland is, it's, it's quite a long way from Cape Town. It's, it's, um, it's around about 400 kilometers away. Uh, often observers don't want to spend a whole week there. They might want to just have one event which they want to um, look at and it maybe takes an hour or two and then you know, they're done. Why should somebody need to travel all the way to Sutherland just for that? So we'd like these instruments and telescopes, if possible, to be remotely accessible. And in the future, we'd like to be able to run these things robotically. That means write a script which operates the telescope, perhaps in the middle of the night, wakes it up at 12 o'clock, takes your data and switches off. So, to facilitate this, we've been developing um, a software framework. Uh, what the framework needs to do is, um, we've got lots of, an instrument is not one thing, it's not one piece of hardware, it's often several pieces um, joined together. So we need to support many types of hardware and often <clears throat> these different components are, um, the, the most appropriate software for them is, it's, it's not the same thing in each case. So we need to support multiple languages. <clears throat> They're not always in the same place. They're not necessarily always run by the same um, host PC. So it, it needs to be a, a distributed system. And we need to, as the instruments mature and, and as we think of new things to do, we need to be able to add new components. So to um, the framework we've uh, come up with, we've separated um, each component of the instrument into uh, into three layers. There's, um, at the bottom, there's the hardware driver layer. Above that is a, is a controller layer. And um, on top of that is a user interface. So each layer's implementation can be chopped and changed without needing to change um, the layers above or below. And then these various components, particularly the, the uh, hardware and the control layers, communicate with one another using TCP IP. So, um, in this framework, um, the, the driver part of the instrument acts as a server with the controller component or the controller layer connecting to this um, and acting as a, as a client. And we've mediated the client-server interactions using Apache Thrift, which I'll talk about in a little while. And then above the controller, we have a, a top-level controller which instantiates each of the controllers and provides some extra business logic. This is a, just a diagram of, of a particular instrument. You can see there, there are three hardware components. There's a filter wheel, a uh, global positioning system, and a camera, um, each with their driver. So each of those th three things are, are, are running in, in their own process. But each of the driver um, bits uh, communicate um, through the thrift interface with a, a dedicated controller, which, as you can see, is then marshaled by a top-level controller and the user interface that's on top of that. So the green um, at the top is, is one process and then there are three processes at the bottom. We looked at a number of different ways of, of doing um, the communication uh, and we eventually chose Apache Thrift. We, uh, what's nice about it is that it provides the interprocess communication layer and the remote procedure call layer. D does it for you, does it very easily. You specify a service um, in an interface definition language file. You then pass this IDL file through the Thrift compiler, which um, generates a whole lot of um, boilerplate code which makes everything work. And it also generates stub code for the client and the server. Um, you can specify when you run the Thrift compiler which languages you, you want to generate code for, and it supports an enormous la every language you can imagine. Uh, wherever possible, we use Python. Uh, where we need to, we, we use C++. 
he has a very simple example of a, of a filter wheel service. Um, there are three methods. There's an initialization, a move method, and a get status method. So the initialize, me initialize you just specify which wheel you want to initialize, the move you say which wheel you want to move, and the position you want to move it to. And then the get status method will return um, a dictionary of, of status for all the wheels. And you run that through the Swift compiler. This is just um, a very basic, uh, I've stripped out a lot of stuff, but this is the kind of um, stub code that gets, in, that gets generated for, for the server side. Um, for the filter wheel case, we have a programmable logic controller which actually drives the, the filter wheel. And so each of these methods would be replaced with something to send serial commands to the PLC. And then on the, on the client side, there's a little bit more detail in the init method. You can see setting up the connection. And then if you look at each of the, the um, methods below, they're basically just calling <coughs> the equivalent method on the, on the far side. As I said, the user interface um, can be changed without needing um, any changes in the underlying controller. So we've, we've developed many different um, a number of different user interfaces. As we do our development, we normally have a command line interface, um, and that helps with diagnostics, testing the functionality of, of the component that we're building. Uh, one of the instruments we're building, um, an astronomer is developing uh, the user interface. He's familiar with um, uh, Python and Qt, so he's going to develop the first draft of that in, in, in PyQt. But for most of the instruments, we plan to have um, uh, we want them to be remotely operable so we can have a web-based interface and we've chosen um, to do this in Flask on top of Python and Brian's going to talk a little bit about that in a while. Then as I said, the, the last thing we'd like, ultimately we'd like these telescopes and instruments to be robotically operable. So we're also developing a scriptable interface. Uh, to start with the instruments that we're, we're applying this framework to, um, there's a big upgrade project at the observatory at the moment. Um, the spectrograph on the 1.9 meter telescope is very old, the throughput is very low. So that's being changed. Um, and while they're upgrading the hardware, we're also going to apply the new, new software framework. We're in the process of designing a new wide field camera, which will also go on the 1.9 meter telescope and will enable um, surveying of the sky at a much faster rate than typically with the, with the narrow field cameras that we use. And then the workhorse, um, instrument for several of the, the smaller telescopes at, at Sutherland is what's known as the, the Sutherland High Speed Optical Camera, Shock. There are in fact three, three of them, um, Shock and Horror, Shock and Disbelief, and Shock and Awe are their names. Uh, <laughs> uh, shock and Horror is on my desk in, in Cape Town, but the other two are up in Sutherland and are, are used regularly. What Shock is, it's, it's a high speed, very accurately timed imaging device. Um, the camera is able to take images, um, take exposures every couple of milliseconds, depending on how you, you set up the detector, what your um, subframe and binning uh, parameters are, but it, it can really take um, these images very rapidly. And it does this, um, it's triggered by, it, does, it takes these images in response to a trigger which is fired by a GPS unit. The GPS unit is, you know, um, connects to the GPS satellites, which are, they have atomic clocks in them, they're extremely accurate. So the, the pulses <coughs> which come down the line are accurate to, to microsecond, the microsecond level. And then generally, to, to complete the instrument, um, one generally wants to have just a, a narrow band of light um, falling on the detector at a certain time. So we have one or two filter wheels um, uh, above the, in the light path, which, which um, restrict the light to what the astronomer is interested in. This is a picture of the shock instrument. Um, it's mounted on the bottom of, I think, the one meter telescope, which is sort of the yellow rim. You can see that's the bottom of the mirror. Um, and the black box is, is part of the telescope. Then the, the blue box that you see is, um, it contains the filter wheels, so that filters the light passing through. And finally, the light strikes the detector, which is at the top of the camera, right at the bottom of, of the instrument. Um, you can see the black cable coming into the camera from kind of that crate up on the left. That's the control crate. There's a GPS unit in there, and the, the, the trigger comes, the trigger signal comes down that black cable, and then the data passes up the white um, cable uh, into a PCI card onto the, onto the host computer. Uh, 
when Shock was first put together, there were a couple of shortcomings with the interface. Um, well, in fact, the interface was three separate user interfaces on not even on the same screen. It made it quite uh, difficult to use. There, there was a homegrown uh, um, lab view application um, which was developed in-house to, to control the filter wheels. Uh, the GPS manufacturer had an application, Windows only, to control um, the GPS, and likewise the camera had a Windows only proprietary application to control the camera. The problem with three separate user interfaces, if you had a workflow where you wanted to, say, do some work on the filter wheel, configure something there, then configure something on the camera, then make some timing changes, go back to the camera, you kind of had to move around from one to the other, and, and it was kind of clunky, so um, that wasn't great. But more importantly, <clears throat> when, you, when you save the data, the data is saved in these files called FITS files, um, Flexible Image Transport System, and at the header of the FITS file is pertinent information about the observations you've made. Now, the camera, which is writing these FITS files, doesn't know about the filter wheel, it doesn't know about um, the timing parameters, so this kind of information wasn't being stored. It was expected of the astronomers to, to put this in by hand, but not all of them got that and not all of them remembered to do it, and some of them spent a week at Sutherland taking data, went back and discovered that their data was worthless. So we kind of, we'd like to get past that. So we've, we've developed this new package. First thing is, it's, um, it's a single user interface. Uh, one interface in a browser with multiple tabs. Secondly, the, the driver part, um, the driver parts run on Linux, so we've, we're freed from having to use Windows. Um, the filter wheel driver component is written in Python using, um, as I said, we communicate with the PLC using serial commands, so we use PySerial extensively. Likewise, um, the GPS uses serial commands, so it's, it's quite similar. And then the camera driver, uh, the API that the hardware manufacturer um, provides is in C++, so we're obliged to use that. But using the framework, we can, we can use all of these together. The great thing is now <coughs> the, we can pass, we can use the top level controller that I mentioned to marshal all the information about the filter wheels and the timing and send that down to the camera. And so the camera, when it writes the FITS headers, it can include the information that, that we need. And in the future, we'll also be able to include telescope pointing information, right ascension and declination, and environmental information like wind speed, humidity, uh, and then other things like the air mass and seeing conditions and so on. So I wanted to give an example of um, why one might need to do high-speed imaging using an instrument like, like shock, or what it's useful for. So and this is an example, there are others, um, but this is an example of an occultation of, of a minor planet like, like Pluto. Um, so the Earth is relatively close to the Sun in the solar system, so it, it, it whizzes around quite rapidly at about 20 kilometers a second. Pluto is so far out that from our perspective, it's almost stationary, so we kind of, you know, we zip past it and it, it seems to be in more or less the same place. And likewise, the fixed stars are so incredibly distant that they are, for all intents and purposes, stationary. Um, Pluto is also far enough away that you, you can't, um, you know, even with the best space telescopes, you can't resolve much more than a few pixels. You, you can't really see details of, 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 of Pluto. And if you want to figure out more, occultations are, are one um, opportunity to do that. Uh, these kinds of things, an occultation is when uh, something moves in front of something else and blocks the light from that, that distant star. So they don't happen often. As I said, Pluto is essentially a, a point source in the sky, and how often that happens that one point source moves in front of another, you know, this, this kind of thing happens maybe a few times a decade. But when it does, well, you can take, you can aim, aim an instrument like shock at that and <clears throat> take a number of readings. So here's, um, this is very interesting. Um, this is in fact an occultation of a star by both Charon, which is a, a, is a moon of Pluto, and Pluto, a grazing occultation of Pluto itself. Now you can see as, as Charon moves in front of, um, in front of the star, there's a, there's a very dramatic drop off um, of the light. It sort of goes from a high level down to almost zero. Um, and then it, you know, there's a very sharp rise again. But as it passes in front of Pluto, you can see it sort of, there's a rounded shoulder as it drops off and a rounded shoulder as, it, as, it, as, as the light um, reaches maximum intensity again. And 
<clears throat> you can only see, you can only really characterize that, that kind of rounded curve by taking many, many um, uh, exposures a second. You know, um, if Pluto, if the Earth's traveling at about 20, 20 kilometers per second and, and Pluto's diameter is about 2,000 kilometers, means this, this kind of whole event happens in about 100 seconds. In fact, for, for Charon, even less because it's got a smaller diameter. So you, you'd like to characterize this properly by taking many, many, you know, um, 20 exposures a second to, to properly characterize that. Anyway, the, the, um, the upshot of this is you can see Charon has no atmosphere, but Pluto, that rounded curve, the interpretation is there's in fact an atmosphere on Pluto. And there's no way that you'd be able to tell this except by using this kind of, um, taking this kind of observation. Okay, so um, we don't only use um, Python in, in instrument building. There, there are a lot of other smaller projects um, that we use. Uh, one of the things is we want to characterize the detectors, the, the charge couple devices um, that we use in all our instruments. Uh, we want to generate what's known as the photon transfer curve, and it's, it's quite easy in Python both to automate obtaining the data for these things and then for these curves, and then you, you use Python to calculate the variance of each image, and you, cal you plot that against the, um, um, the exposure, the, the length of the exposure for each image, and you, you get this curve from which you can deduce data about each CCD um, has slightly different properties. You can, you can deduce <coughs> the properties of the CCD, and then you can use that when you, when you um, use the instruments for scientific observations. Um, Python is used extensively. Uh, Steve talked yesterday about Python in the SALT data reduction pipeline and also in the smaller telescope pipeline. Um, it's used as a glue language to, to join many tools together. Um, and the last thing is um, that I'll mention is we have a, an observatory-wide time service where we, we provide time accurately for, um, for many um, uh, services at the university uh, at the observatory. Um, it has, this was done using various equipment, I think, which was built in the 60s and coded in C. Uh, and we've now replaced that with um, a Raspberry Pi connected to a GPS system, and Python is the coding language for that. So Brian's now going to talk about the shock interface a little bit. Thanks, Carl. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'll be talking you, to you about the web interface that we've built for the shock instrument uh, on top of this uh, new controller layer that Carl just mentioned. Um, I'll take you to, through some of the decisions that we've made along the line. And at the end, if there's some time, um, I'll show you a quick demo to show you how it all works. Um, to start with, um, we had some uh, overarching goals and requirements. Um, First, the most obvious one, I think, is that it needs to be remotely accessible. And since we're talking about a, a web interface, uh, it should be accessible from a browser. Um, it should also be fast and responsive. And um, the interface should be reliable. And since we're dealing with valuable scientific data, um, if it's running on the same system where the data is being processed, uh, it shouldn't take uh, up too much of the machine's uh, resources. Uh, so here's a diagram showing you um, how the interface fits or where it fits into the rest of the system. Uh, so the idea is for the uh, astronomer to uh, be able to drive the, um, the whole instrument from within a web browser. <coughs> uh, they'll open up their favorite browser on, on, the, on a laptop um, and uh, start their observation. So in the, in the diagram there you can see the web uh, browser connects to the web server using HTTP. And then the web server also acts as a thrift client so it can speak to the hardware on the other end. So that basically covers the, um, how things are put together and uh, how they communicate with each other. Um, so uh, what uh, did we use to build it and why? Uh, starting with Python. Uh, now besides all the obvious technical reasons, um, I think one of the main reasons is that Python's already widely used uh, at the observatory. Uh, so in theory, there's plenty of people that can contribute to the project if they want to. Um, uh, choosing Flask honestly had a lot to do with the fact that I used it before and I, um, I kind of liked it min its minimal design. 
uh, compared to something like Django, for example, it's a bit more flexible in some ways. Um, uh, Django, I, I mean, a complete framework, a more complete framework, um, ha, um, many decisions have been kind of made for you, so it's a bit harder to adapt if you have uh, specific needs. And then um, display incoming data from the camera. We, we need a fast connection between, between the web browser and the web server. Uh, for that, we use uh, something called G-Unicorn, which is uh, an HTTP server, and WebSockets. Um, and then, uh, just lastly, for completeness sake, in the browser, we use something called back, like Backbone.js. Um, um, and that wasn't part of the initial design, but I'll talk about that a bit later. And then finally, we used a bootstrap theme for the actual UI, uh, which saved a lot of time because we didn't have to uh, write a bunch of CSS. Um, so just a quick overview uh, of what Flask is and how it works, if anyone who doesn't know. It's a micro framework, uh, which means it gives you the bare minimum to build a web application. And it combines two other projects to do that, um, something called Werkzeug, uh, which is a whiskey toolkit uh, that allows your application to speak um, HTTP. And then um, Jinja, um, which is a templating library um, so very similar to Django's templates, if you've ever used that. Um, so the basic idea be behind Flask is that it routes um, URLs to code or functions. And um, I'll show you a, a quick example of uh, what that means. Um, this is a low world example from the Flask uh, website. Um, all you need to do is import Flask, uh, create a new Flask application, and then decorate the function and indicate which URL that function should handle. Um, in this specific example, if someone visits the root of your site, uh, they'll see the uh, text hello world display in their browser. Um, so I want to take the, um, the rest of the talk to just go into some of the technical aspects uh, to show you how it's all put together. Um, in the initial design, the web browser uh, communicated with the web server using uh, something called uh, JSON RPC. And um, so what that means is uh, it would send some encoded data to the, to the server containing a method name and some parameters. Um, and the server would then invoke that method and return a response to the browser. Now, um, JSON RP is a, RPC is a fairly uh, straightforward protocol. But one of the downsides is that you need to embed a lot of implementation details in your client code. Um, so um, later we um, implemented the GPS functionality in the interface. And at this point, the JavaScript was kind of starting to spiral out of control. Um, so I was looking for a way to give it a bit more structure and uh, make it a, a more maintainable. Um, and I used Backbone.js before and liked it for some of the res same reasons I like Flask. Um, it's lightweight and doesn't make too many assumptions uh, about uh, what you're building or how you're doing it. Um, now, what the, the effect that that has is it simplifies the, the code on the client, uh, but unfortunately it makes it, uh, things a bit more difficult for us on the server um, because now instead of um, asking the server to move the filter wheel to a specific position, we just send it the posi position we want it to be in. And the reason for that being is that um, one of the assumptions that Backbone.js uh, makes is that your API endpoints needs to be uh, follow a RESTful design. Okay, so um, to give you an idea uh, of what are the com comparison between RPC and REST. Um, RPC being a remote procedure call. Um, uh, REST is a representational, representational state transfer. Um, and uh, on this side, on the REST, the new uh, approach, we use a patch uh, HTTP method um, because we want, only want to do partial updates. Um, with a usual RESTful API design, um, po uh, post input is reserved for creating or updating resources. Um, and it would expect all the attributes of the resource, uh, even if they haven't changed. Now, the tricky thing is that we need to somehow 
map this incoming data to methods that we want to invoke on the fall-to-wheel controller. Um, and for that, we kind of uh, we create this uh, kind of a proxy object uh, or class, um, and then we define a property with a setter, and inside the setter, we invoke the the method that we want to uh, call. So if we want to, if we set a uh, the position parameter on the on instances of the filter wheel, that will end up calling the the move command on the filter wheel controller. Um, so this is our patch handler. Um, what we do inside is inside the patch function is instantiate the filter wheel class. Uh, loop through each of the key value pairs in the dictionary that we receive from the browser, and then set each of those as properties on the filter wheel object. And to set all of that in motion um, from the browser, we call uh, save uh, the save method on a backbone model, which ends up sending the patch request to the server. And in this example, it will move the filter wheel to position eight. And uh, so that about covers the technical details. Now for the demo. Um, the, dem the demo is just a, a series of uh, screenshots, but I'll take you through the typical workflow of um, setting everything up and starting the camera for data acquisition. Okay. So there's the new shock web interface, or the shock interface, rather. Um, all nicely contained within one window. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see this, but on the top left, we have a main menu um, with links to the various components of the instrument, uh, the filter wheel, the GPS, and the camera. Now, um, we only have uh, one of the two uh, wheels installed in, this, in the filter wheel um, on, the, on the right side in the B slot. Um, at the top, you'll see there's some green indicators there indicating whether the um, filter wheel has been initialized, uh, whether it's uh, centered or moving, and so forth. And then below that, uh, there's a control uh, showing you what the current position is. Uh, below that, we have the required position with the um, move and initialize buttons just below that, and then a list of filters and a reset button. Uh, now, if you want to move the filter wheel to, to the empty, empty slot in position eight, We'll change the required position uh, to eight and click the move button. Um, this is just an updated view to show you uh, what it looks like once I've moved it to position eight. Um, we, we then jump to the camera um, interface. And now unlike the, the other components, the, kind of the camera isn't always running because uh, it's got a cooler that uh, shouldn't be running for extended, extended periods. Uh, so we switch that on, and that brings all the uh, up, up all of the co uh, controls for the camera, and it'll start uh, cooling to a point where uh, that will reduce the amount of noise uh, in our data. Okay, and then we go to the GPS, um, so we can configure how often the camera is triggered. Uh, we set the start date and start time to some some point in the future that we want. Uh, to start our observation on. Uh, we click the Apply button to save our settings. Uh, now we go back to the camera, um, and it's uh, by this time it's kind of cooled down to a stable point. You'll see the green indicator at the top there. Um, we configure some of the other parameters, and we click the Start button. And that will bring up a uh, live view of the data as it's coming in from the camera. And that just about wraps up the demo. I'll just hand it over to Carl for some closing thoughts. Thanks. <clears throat> so, um, as Brian showed you, we have a, we have a, a web interface now to the, to the software. Um, one of the things I said about Sutherland is it's a long way away. It's also, in winter, it's, it's pretty cold. And when you sit in the domes taking data, the domes are not necessarily um, the warmest places. You sit in what's known as the warm room, but in fact, that's a bit of a misnomer. It's the same temperature as the rest of the dome. And 
<clears throat> this is after a particularly bad, bl bad blizzard when the snow actually got in through the dome cover and you can imagine what it's like. So now that we have a, a web and remote inf interface, we're hoping that you can take your data somewhat like that rather. <clears throat> so, cool. thank you. Thank you, Carl and Brian. We have time for a couple of questions, but for questions, I'm not sure how many people know that despite everything Carl and Brian have said about um, not wanting to go there, it is actually a really nice place to go and visit if you don't have to. Um, and, <laughs> and they do have, um, do they still have the tours? Absolutely. Uh, it really is a nice place to go. I don't want to knock it. Um, <laughs> and, and they do do tours. It's, it's a, especially um, to take a tour and to see the telescopes and to see salt. It's, a, it's an experience everybody should try at least once. Cool. Um, go in summer. There was a question over here. If someone can just pass the microphone back a bit. Do the, si do the scientists ever allow anyone to sort of shoulder surf? Sorry, I didn't hear. Do the scientists ever allow anyone to shoulder surf? Now that you're streaming the data out. Um, no. Uh, uh, I mean, the data is um, it's published eventually, um, but I, I think the raw data isn't generally available um, as far as I know. Um, yeah. Um, any, any reason why not? I mean, it sounds like... Uh, I, I'm not really sure why it, why it would be. You know, I think, uh, you know, sure, if, some, if somebody really wanted to see the data, I think that, that it would be available. Um, but it's not published generally for everyone to see. The other thing I didn't mention is, is you know, we have this web interface. We, we, we haven't implemented it yet, but we're going to have to be concerned about security. Um, we don't want multiple people to be accessing the instrument at the same time. And, in fact, we don't want anybody who shouldn't be, you know, so we're going to have to have some authorization and authentication me mechanism um, built in, which we haven't done yet, but that is part of what we're going to do. At the moment, it runs on a private network, so it's, it's all right. But, sure. but in terms of the data, if, you, if there's something you particularly want to, to find out and write to the astronomer or contact someone, it, it would be available, I think. Cool. So you mentioned this uh, time service for the observatory, which yes. obviously has um, some hard real-time requirements. Is Python actually sitting in a hard real-time path, or is it just controlling some real-time systems? Um, it's, more, it's controlling real-time systems. So th the time comes from a GPS unit, um, which is connected to the, the Raspberry Pi. Um, as I said, the previous system was a, was a bunch of um, components largely written in C a long time ago. Um, and. Uh, they get their, you know, there, there's a, they get the time from, from a GPS system. There's a backup system where they, <coughs> I think they use the six pips from the SABC. Um, uh, yeah, there's a number of ways of getting the time, but it is primarily GPS based, and so the Python is acting as a kind of a glue for all of that. Yes. Cool. I think we have time for one more question. Um, can you wait for the mic? Thanks. Can you just tell us uh, why you use or chose Apache Thrift and what your other options were? Um, we looked, well, initially I looked at, um, at JSON RPC as, as the RPC layer. Um, we looked at a couple of um, uh, things for the interprocess communication layer. We, uh, I looked at vanilla TCP IP. I looked at, um, we looked at, uh, Zero MQ was one of them, um, and uh, JSON RPC I think had the drawback. It wasn't a single provider of, um, so there was somebody did JSON RPC for Python, somebody else did JSON RPC for C, somebody else for C++, and I, I think I, I don't know, I didn't find it work together very nicely. I think the C, C one was not very complete or it didn't work very nicely. Um, Thrift just works, and it's you know it's it's one. It was originally um, produced by um, Facebook, and then put into the um, Apache incubator, uh, and it just works. It's it's you know it generates it, it it does both the IPC and the RPC, which is great. Um, what else did I look at? I looked at uh, zero RPC based on top of zero MQ. 
that unfortunately only supports Python and Node.js, which is no good for us. Um, yeah, so that's so we ended up with Thrift, and I, I <coughs> the documentation of, of Apache Thrift is not fantastic, but you know once you've got it working, it's 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 great. Cool. Thank you once again.